without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker tonight, who is a cardiologist, and uh, Dr. Robert Osfeld. He's the founder and director of uh, the Cardiac Wellness Program at Montefiore Medical Center in New York City, uh, where he encourages patients to embrace a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, Dr. Osfeld earned his MD at Yale and his uh, Master of Science in Epidemiology at Harvard and uh, a fine um, penal institution north of Yale, north of New Haven. That's a joke for Yaleys. And he's an associate professor of clinical medicine at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and the associate director of the cardiology fellowship at Montefiore Einstein. He earned his BA from the University of Pennsylvania, graduated summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa, uh, has MD from Yale, as I said. Um, Anyway, his professional interests include uh, cardiovascular disease prevention, medical education, and clinical research. He earned the outstanding full-time attending of the year award at Montefiore for excellence in teaching medical residents, the program director's award for dedicated service on behalf of the Montefiore Einstein Cardiology Fellowship, and was elected to the Leo M. Davidoff Society at Einstein for outstanding achievement in the teaching of medical students. So he's a consummate teacher. We're very excited to have Dr. Oswell here tonight. So welcome, Dr. Oswell. So Ted, thank you so much for that incredibly generous introduction. It's a real pleasure to be with all of you here uh, tonight. This is my second time ever in Rochester, and I know this is just what it's like in January as well. So, but I mean, it just, everything's easier here. I, I, took, I, I live in New York City, and it took me over an hour to get to the airport this morning. And then from the airport to the hotel where I'm staying was like five minutes of the most pleasant drive you've ever had ever in your life which you guys have every single day. Yeah. So I'm slightly envious. Um, so <clears throat> I've been interested in health and prevention for a long time. You know, when I was a kid, I had a couple of brothers who died from an incurable disease. So ever since then, I've been interested in health and prevention. <clears throat> and one thing led to another, and I became a cardiologist. And, you know, a lot of years of medical training, it was like 11 years. And I learned a lot of great stuff, you know, about medications and procedures, which can be important. And I got the chance to interact with incredible physicians and scientists. But even after all those 11 years, I learned virtually nothing about nutrition. And I mean, when I finished up, I kind of knew that a Mediterranean style diet was good, but I couldn't really define it. Um, and if you told me about plant-based nutrition then, frankly, I would have thought it was weird. And so <clears throat> uh, I was, you know, I, so I came down to Montefiore to do all the things I was trained to do. And I started getting a little disillusioned because, you know, people got a little bit better. Medications are helpful. Procedures are helpful. Um, you know, maybe a Mediterranean-style diet could be somewhat helpful. But, you know, there, there wasn't transformational change. There's a teeny bit better here, a teeny bit better there, but I didn't go into medicine to get people a teeny bit better. And so it was right around that time that I stumbled across the China study, and I met a gentleman wearing a China study shirt here today uh, that Tom Campbell had signed. Um, but uh, so, and I quickly looked at the heart disease section, being a myopic cardiologist, and I was really taken by it. And then one thing led to another, and I started the cardiac wellness program at Montefiore with the goal of preventing and reversing disease with a plant-based diet. And I say disease, not just heart disease, because yeah, it's good for your heart, but it's good for you for dozens and dozens of other reasons. And I've been a cardiologist now for about 15 years. Um, and outside of a medical emergency, like somebody gets shot and has to be put back together again, I've never seen anything come close to the breadth and depth of benefits that a plant-based diet provides. We quite literally have patients crying tears of joy in our office. They feel so much better. Um, so I want to share, I think I'll share a couple of patient examples with you. Uh, this one was, both of them happened really early on in our program and, and helped me feel like we were on a good path. So the first one was this um, woman about 60 years old and she had had a heart attack and she um, was taken care of at another hospital. And they, put her, they had her on all the good medications, and they did a cardiac catheterization where they look at the blood vessels that feed the heart with blood. And there were lots of blockages there, and they had recommended bypass surgery, which was a very evidence-based decision or recommendation at the time. Quite reasonable, but she didn't want it. That's cool. Patient's the boss. So she's on all the good meds, and she survived, and she left the hospital, and she somehow found us. And she was already on all the good meds, so we put her on a plant-based diet. That's all we had left to do. She didn't want any procedures done. 
And so basically what that means is if something has a face or comes from something with a face, don't eat it. So we put her on a plant-based diet, and then at the time when she started, she could really only walk about across the room. And then she'd get short of breath from all the cholesterol disease in her heart. So fast forward three or four months, she's now walking on a treadmill for 20 to 30 minutes, and she gets a little short of breath then. Her cholesterol fell another 70 points on top of what it had already fallen on the statin. And she, and she lost like 15 pounds, and she was doing great. But it got kind of weird because I couldn't really reach her anymore. Like, I, I tried to call, it just never worked. And then, like, three months later, I get this call from another hospital that she had had chest pain, and she's about to have bypass surgery. I'm like, what's going on? It didn't make any sense. So, like, what I later learned is that there was this major rift in her family, and half of her family thought the plant-based diet was great. And the other half of her family thought the plant-based diet was not great. And so she was living with the half of the family who thought it was great and eating that way during the three months that she got better. But then she moved to live with the half of the family who thought it was the opposite of great. She went back to her prior habits, eating habits, and over the course of three months decompensated and had bypass surgery. So for me, that was an incredible end of one example of how quickly people can get better and how quickly they can decompensate just by dietary change. Which brings me to the second patient example. Um, uh, this is a guy, about 60, and he started having chest discomfort. You know, he'd like, first it would be walking around, then he'd get it, and sometimes then even sitting still. And so he went to go see his, his local doc, and they did a stress test where he you know, ran on a treadmill and they took a picture of his heart. And it's only in, in medicine, well, so his test was positive, and it's only in medicine that the word positive like, means something bad. But so, you know, he, uh, so it showed that he had evidence of cholesterol blockages in the blood vessels that feed his heart with blood. Uh, but okay, so they were recommending uh, medications and, and, a stent, and a cardiac catheterization so they could take a closer look. But he said, Doc, I don't want to take any of those cholesterol-lowering pills. Okay, patient's the boss. In fact, he wouldn't even take an aspirin. He wouldn't take anything. And he said, Doc, I don't want anything stuck in me, which means no, no cardiac catheterization. So um, in that context, there was really limited stuff medically that we could do, and he went on a plant-based diet. No faces. So this is him when he started. Uh, you can see his, uh, he was a little overweight. His uh, LDL, a little, blood pressure is a little high. LDL is quite high, that's a bad cholesterol. And he can maybe walk one to three blocks and he'd stop because of chest discomfort. So remember, he didn't want anything stuck in him, didn't want to take any medications. So this is the kind of stuff he ate. It was a whole food, plant-based diet. Tons of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, beans, lentils, etc. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna circle back to this guy in a little bit and we'll see how he did. Okay, so what we're gonna talk about is the scope of the problem. When I say problem, I mean um, uh, the cholesterol disease in the blood vessels that feed the heart with blood. And uh, we're gonna talk a bit about the pathophysiology, why it happens, why a plant-based diet, and then we're gonna go somewhere scary for a cardiologist, but not an interventional radiologist, which is of course beyond the heart. So, uh, what, I need some audience participation. I need some help. What percentage of 12 to 14 year olds in the US have early signs of cholesterol disease in the blood vessels that feed their, excuse me, that feed their heart with blood? 60, 90, 50%. 70. I, I think I heard between 50 and 100%. So, y'all are absolutely right. It is indeed between 50 and 100%. But you're way better than the medical students that I work with because they usually tell me between zero and 100%, but they're you know, professional test takers. So. <laughs> so, so you're absolutely right. It is 65, about 65% of 12 to 14 year olds in the US have early signs of cholesterol disease in the blood vessels that feed their heart with blood. And we know this from pathology studies of kids who died for other reasons and they examined their heart. And as I look around the room, I'm pretty sure that we are all older than 12. I mean, maybe not like emotionally, but like, you know, <laughs> at least numerically. So 
<clears throat> okay, so it's quite common, and about two heart attacks happen every minute in the U.S. So maybe I've been speaking 10 minutes. That's 20 heart attacks. 20 heart attacks have happened in the U.S. since I started speaking. A heart attack is, of course, when part of the heart muscle dies from a cholesterol blockage. It is the number one killer of adult men and adult women in the U.S. Women are six to seven times more likely to die from cardiovascular disease than they are from breast cancer. Now, clearly, you do not want either one, but it highlights the epidemiologic importance of heart disease in women. It's a very expensive disease, and half of heart attacks happen in people with, quote, normal cholesterol levels. So in a country where it is normal to die from heart disease, I think our whole notion of normal is anything but. Okay, so uh, we talked about the scope of the problem, it's obscene. Let's talk a little bit about the pathophysiology or why it happens. So these slides are courtesy of Dr. Klatt and Dr. Esselstyn. Um, so this is an artery. This is a normal artery, the center where the blood flows, the wall of the artery. This little brown line here, that's the endothelial cell. We're going to want to treat that well. well. We'll circle back to that. So that's normal. And because I went to medical school, I can tell you that this is abnormal. Um, yep, four years, that's right. So, uh, and this is, you can see here, tons of cholesterol blockage and a teeny tiny little opening for the blood to flow. So you, could, you may know some people, they go for a walk and then, ah, oh, they get chest pressure, they take that pill under their tongue and then it goes away and then they do it again and it just keeps on repeating itself. Well, this is what they have. They have a blockage just like that. So we want to prevent that from happening. So how do these heart attacks happen in the first place? Well, these are three arteries. This is the wall of the artery. This is the center of the artery where the blood flows. These little yellow dots, those are cholesterol particles. So what happens is those endothelial cells can get damaged. That little brown, that little thin brown line of cells lining the inner wall of your blood vessels, kind of like wallpaper, well, they can get injured. And whether that's the toxic Western diet or inflammation or pollution or smoking, somehow they get injured. And when that happens, those cholesterol particles burrow from the center of the artery across into the wall where they then become oxidized, like, and kind of like a splinter. So if you, ever, if you ever had a splinter in your finger, it gets all red and inflamed. Well, it's the same kind of thing, except it's happening in the wall of your artery, exactly where you don't want it. So that creates a ton of inflammation, oxidative stress. Makes the artery sicker every second of every day. It damages the endothelial cells even more more of these cholesterol particles burrow across, and it's sort of a, a gradual snowball effect, making the artery sicker and the blockage grow. Now, there's this little white line here. Uh, that's called the fibrous cap, and that's the only thing that's separating that whole cholesterol plaque from the blood, and you don't ever want these two things to touch because this cholesterol plaque can make the blood clot. And so, if these things touch, boom, this blood could clot, and then there's no more blood flow in the blood vessel, and that's a giant heart attack. Now, if you cut yourself and you bleed, you want a clot, or you're going to bleed to death, but you don't want a clot in your artery because it's going to block blood flow to the heart muscle. So what happens is over time, with all that oxidative stress, the fibrous cap gets thinner and thinner and weaker and weaker, and then just some random Tuesday afternoon with the blood flow flowing by at each heartbeat, boom, it cracks. And then all this cholesterol plaque gets exposed to the blood, clots it off, shuts the door, no more blood flow, and that's a medical emergency. You want to stent right away when that's happening. This is a histologic picture. Uh, you can see here, this is the center of the artery where the blood flows, all that cholesterol plaque. This person had plaque rupture, fibrous cap rupture, and you can see the artery clotted off and they died. This is a picture of a heart. Here, this is a coronary artery where the blood flows, plaque of the fibrous cap rupture, they had a clot, large heart attack, and they died. Uh, okay, the scope of the problem, it's obscene, pathophysiology, we talked a little bit about why that happens, and so what we'll talk about now is why a plant-based diet. Why might a plant-based diet be helpful? So we're gonna go through a few different pieces of evidence. Uh, we're gonna talk about some epidemiology studies, big population studies. We'll talk about TMAO, trimethylamine oxide, which is one of the newer kids on the block. 
Uh, we're going to talk about those endothelial cells, that wallpaper, that little brown line. We'll talk about some interventional studies, what happens if we put people on plants. And then we'll go somewhere scary for a cardiologist, um, other places. What I like to do is to look to where heart disease is not to get a clue as to why that might be. So that brings me to our first stop, which is, which is in China. And this is data from the 1970s, 1980s, the China study. They looked at about 6,500 people all across China. And they had tons of medical information, tons of dietary information. And basically what they found is the fewer animal products you ate, the less disease you had. And it just kept going. Fewer and fewer animal products, less and less disease. And it wasn't just heart disease. It was cancer. It was bone diseases. It was inflammatory diseases. OK, maybe that's just China in the 1970s and 1980s. Well, let's bounce to modern day China, which brings me to this awesome study by Dr. Du. And Dr. Du looked at about 40, 450,000 people with over 3 million person years of follow-up. And what that means is if you follow me in a study for one year, that's one person year of follow-up. He had over 3 million person years of follow-up. That's a lot of follow-up. So what he asked is, what happens if you eat more fresh fruit? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it neutral? What happens? Well, it turns out for these 450,000 people, the more fresh fruit you ate, the better you did. Less cardiovascular death, fewer strokes, um, the blood, your blood pressure was lower, and eating more fruit was also associated with lower blood sugar. Yes, eating more fruit was associated with lower blood sugar. I'm kind of getting tired of hearing how fruit causes diabetes. But they decided to take a slightly deeper dive into that. And in this analysis of about 480,000 people or so, a uh, similar data set, they asked, well, if you eat more fresh fruit, are you more likely to get diabetes? Turns out, no. The more fresh fruit you ate, the less likely you were to develop diabetes. But what if you had diabetes when this study started? Did that make a difference? Well, they had 30,000 people who had diabetes when this study started. And the more fresh fruit they ate, the better they did. They lived longer. Well, maybe that's just China. Let's bounce to South Africa. So this is a really cool study by Dr. Burkett of Burkett Lymphoma fame. And what Dr. Burkett uh, noted, this was in the kind of like the 1970s, is that the South African white population had a really high rate of heart disease. And they were eating a typical Western diet, you know, milk, meat, that kind of thing. But the South African black population was living right next door, but eating much more of a plant-based diet, they seemed to have much, much lower rates of heart disease. So we decided to try and quantify that. So we went to this hospital in Johannesburg where the South African black population would get admitted. And they had about 40,000 admissions a year. And he looked over 10 years and said, okay, we're gonna look in the medical charts and we're gonna see how many cases of heart disease were diagnosed over 10 years. And they looked and looked and over 400,000 people, and they found 30. Three, zero cases of heart disease in the medical charts. And you know, maybe there was a selection bias, or maybe they didn't write it down, but I could take you, but that's 400,000 people over about 10 years. I could take you to the cardiac floor at Montefiore, where I work right now, and I'm sure at Strong Memorial Hospital, right around the corner, and there are more than 30 cases of heart disease right now. And, and actually, in the 1950s and 1960s, doctors in Uganda used to write these things called case reports about patients with heart disease. And a case report is meant to be something that is so unusual that it's so worthwhile to describe one single case of it because it's going to profoundly increase the education level of, of your fellow doctors. If I wrote a case report about garden variety heart disease now and sent it to a medical journal, they would laugh me out of the medical profession. Times have changed. It's because they were seeing it so infrequently there then. Okay, let's bounce to the US. This is a great study by Dr. Song. And what Dr. Song did is he asked, what happens if I replace just 3% of calories 
from animal protein with 3% of calories from plant-based protein. What happens? Is it good? Is it bad? I don't know. So he looked at 130,000 people with over 3.5 million person years of follow-up. So okay, if you replace just 3% of your calories from processed red meat with 3% of calories from plant-based proteins, that's associated with a 34% lower hazard of death. How about unprocessed red meat? 12% lower hazard of death. And just to remind us, the World Health Organization came out recently and said that processed red meats, well, they're a class one carcinogen. And a class one carcinogen, that means it's carcinogenic. It causes cancer. That's the same category, mind you, that plutonium is in. <laughs> And unprocessed red meats, they call a, a class 2A carcinogen, which means it's likely carcinogenic. Well, how about if you replace just 3% of your calories from poultry with 3% of calories from plant-based protein, 6% lower, uh, which is significant hazard of death. How about fish, 6% eggs, 19% dairy, 8%. It's impressive. Okay, so we're gonna bounce to England, which may or may not still be part of Europe. But in this analysis, they looked at about 65,000 people. And they said, well, okay, what happens if you eat more fruits and vegetables? And they looked over about seven years. And it turns out the more servings of fruits and vegetables that you had per day was associated with living longer. And it just kept on going, four, five, six, seven servings of fruits and vegetables a day. But they couldn't look beyond that because so few people ate um, that more than seven servings of fruits and vegetables a day that the statistics fell apart. So then let's bounce back to the US, the Cardia study. Um, and this may be of particular interest to some of the younger people in the audience. This is a coronary artery risk determinant in youth study. And in this analysis, it looked at about 2,500 people who were about 25 years of age. 25 years of age. And they put them into three categories. Category number one, the lowest amount of fruit and vegetable consumption, two middle, and three, the most amount of fruit and vegetable consumption. And then they looked 20 years later. They did a CAT scan of the heart looking for heart disease. What did they find? They found that you were, if you were in the highest group of fruit and vegetable consumption versus the lowest, you had a 26% lower odds of developing coronary artery disease. Ah, the Seventh-day Adventists. That's a religious organization. They treat their bodies like a temple. They have a, a variety of healthy lifestyle measures. And um, even those who eat a typical Western diet, or eat a Western diet, eat a more healthful version than the average American. And so in this analysis, they looked at those with uh, diabetes by dietary type. So they had non-vegetarians, semi-vegetarians, pesco-vegetarians, lacto ovo vegetarians and the vegans. And here the vegans were least likely to have a diabetes. And this is in about 60,000 people. And also in this analysis, they looked at body mass index and the only group with a normal body mass index, which is less than 25, was the vegans. But you know, like most things, the devil is in the details. Now, you could be plant-based and eat sugar cookies all day or you could eat kale all day. Does that make a difference? Well, this study took a look at just that. So here, this along here is more of a plant-based diet. And this little blue hatch line, that's a plant-based diet. So the more of that you did, the better you did. The lower your rate of heart disease. But they said, you know what? Let's split them up into sugar cookies and kale and see if there's a difference. So if you ate kale, a healthy plant-based diet, which is vegetables, fruits, whole grains, that's the red line, you did even better. But what if you were a sugar cookie vegan? Nope, you did worse. And then they did another very interesting spin on the data right here. So this is a healthy plant-based diet. So the more of a healthy plant-based diet you ate, the better you did. This blue hatch line, that's a less healthy plant-based diet, so you did worse. But what about this red line? That's animal foods. So if you were a junk food vegan, you did just about the same in this data set as those eating animal products. So the devil is, of course, in the details. 
busy slide. But it's so it's such a great study. Um, and a cardiologist, Dr. Katharisan, headed it up. And in this analysis, oh, and one of the reasons I have it here is, you know, what this study looks at is um, they took about 20, looked at 26 genetic markers of heart disease. And if you have these more of these markers, you know, it's associated with doing worse. So they, what they did is they split people into thirds. And they said, well, okay, if you have the highest amount of genetic risk, middle and lowest amount of genetic risk. And not surprisingly, toward the bottom is the highest genetic risk. And the more of a genetic risk that you had, the worse that you did. Okay, genes matter. But the reason I have this up here is because a lot of the times my patients will say, oh, you know, Dr. Ostfeld, disease X, Y, or Z runs in my family, so it's just going to happen anyway. Well, lifestyle runs in families too. So, and what they did in this analysis, what was really cool about it, is in addition to splitting people in thirds of genetic risk, they split people into thirds of lifestyle risk. So lowest risk, middle risk, and least healthy lifestyle. So I should say most healthy, middle healthy, and least healthy lifestyle. And here, this is the highest genetic risk category here. This is the least healthy lifestyle and the most healthy lifestyle. So if you had the most healthy lifestyle in the highest genetic risk category, you lowered your future risk of a cardiovascular event by 50%. So it's impressive. So genes matter, but lifestyle matters too. What do people say? Genes load the gun, but lifestyle pulls the trigger. But what's even cooler about this, well, interesting, I should say, is to get into the healthiest lifestyle group, the threshold was really low. So you, you had to exercise, okay, that's important, but you had to exercise once a week. That got you into the healthiest group. You had to eat more healthfully than 50% of the people in the study. Well, what if you exercised four times a week? What if you ate more healthfully than 90% of the people in the study? Maybe this would have been much less than 50%. Okay, we did a bit of a world tour. Let's talk about TMAO or trimethyl amine oxide. Okay, TMAO is not your friend. Um, the higher levels you have of it in your blood, it's associated with dying sooner, more heart disease, diabetes, cancer, blood being more likely to clot. Okay, well, so who cares? What can you do about that? Well, it's interesting, they gave, uh, there was a study they, they did where they took, they gave people a steak. They gave either omnivores a steak to eat or vegans a steak to eat, and they ate it. And um, they looked at the level of trimethylamine oxide that was made in the blood. So it turns out that the omnivores, after eating a steak, made much more trimethylamine oxide than did the vegans. So what's up with that? Well, um, it turns out that it's our gut bacteria. And we each have about a trillion gut bacteria, and I don't know, there, maybe there are 150 people in the room, so that's 150 trillion gut bacteria hanging out with us right now. You can really say that we're the parasites, not them. But, uh, so it's subtle differences in the gut bacteria between vegans and omnivores that account for this difference. When you eat a plant-based diet, you select for different gut bacteria than if you eat an animal-based diet, and you select for healthier ones with a plant-based diet. And it's that difference that accounts for the difference in trimethylamine oxide formation. So those gut bacteria interact with L-carnitine to ultimately make trimethylamine oxide. But L-carnitine is structurally similar to choline, and choline is a required nutrient. Who cares? Well, choline is in chicken. Choline is in fish. Choline is in dairy. Choline is in egg yolks. So when you eat those things, you also make trimethylamine oxide. But the good news is that choline is in plants, and when you eat plants, you can get the choline that you need. But wait, Dr. Osfeld, you just said if you eat choline, you can make trimethylamine oxide. But if you get it from plants, you select for virtually none of the gut bacteria that can lead to the formation of TMAO. So you get the choline that you need, you select for virtually none of the gut bacteria, and you get dozens and dozens of other healthy plant-based nutrients. 
Okay, world tour, TMAO, endothelial cells. Here we go. The little wallpaper. How many, what is the circumference of the Earth in miles? Yeah, about 24, 25,000 miles, exactly. How many miles of blood vessels do we have in our bodies? We have about 60,000. About 60,000 miles of blood vessels in our body. And I know this because I saw it on the George Washington University cardiology webpage. That's why I know that. <laughs> um, so you can imagine, if you treat your blood vessels well, you treat every square millimeter of your body well. These are endothelial cells. Um, they're the, that little brown line. They make something called nitric oxide, and Nobel Prize was awarded for the, for the identification of it. And when you eat more of a plant-based diet, you enable your endothelial cells to make more nitric oxide, which is a good thing. So if I go for a run, you know, my legs need more blood, so the nitric oxide can help my blood vessels dilate. Nitric oxide is anti-inflammatory. It is antioxidant. It makes the blood vessels, the blood less likely to clot. It quiets down the inflammation in the wall of your blood vessels. So nitric oxide is your friend. And when you eat a plant-based diet, you enable yourself to make more of it. So this is a great comic. Halfway through his hearty man breakfast, Dwayne thought he heard some of his smaller arteries slamming shut. So I think this is interesting for a couple of reasons. One is the whole notion of the hardy man. You know, like that image has been evolving over time, but I think we could agree, you know, like a cigar smoking, steak eating guys, hardy guy, which is of course the exact opposite of what you need to do if you actually want to be hardy. Um, but the other thing is his smaller arteries slamming shut. And he's right. And this brings me to great work by Dr. Vogel, Dr. Robert Vogel, a cardiologist. And what Dr. Vogel looked at is he looked at blood vessel function. And what he would do is he'd inflate a blood pressure cuff up on the arm so there was no more blood flow to the hand, and he'd leave it there for five minutes so it's not, like, comfortable. And then you let go, and then you look at the artery to the hand. Normally it dilates up because the hand's been starved of blood. That's normal. So what he did is he took young, healthy men and fed them either whole grain cereal or, like, fatty processed foods and hash browns and stuff, so, and looked at their blood vessel function. So these are young, healthy men, and so he gives, gives them the whole grain cereal, boom, their di arteries dilate up, no problem. But then he gives them the, the fatty animal product meal. What happens? Blood vessels don't dilate up. And it about takes five, six hours, then they're back to normal. But then you know what time it is. It's lunchtime, and it's chicken parmesan, and it's dinner, and it's pizza, and it is breakfast and it's scrambled eggs. You know, it's just like meal after meal, like Mike Tyson is in there pounding away at those endothelial cells, and it's no wonder that they give out over time. But I did hear that Mike Tyson is now vegan. Yeah, um, so no more ears for Iron Mike. Um, but uh, the only reason I said that is because I heard he wasn't gonna be here today. Um, so, but you know what? It doesn't just impact your blood vessel function. It doesn't just impact your blood vessel function. Uh, an, one single unhealthy meal, like the kind those young men had, can impact lung function. In fact, asthmatics, asthmatics are more likely to get readmitted to the hospital because of bronchospasm after eating like that. Okay, so blood vessel function, lung function. Well, it also impacts your liver function, one unhealthy meal. Uh, Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is the most common reason now for liver failure in the U.S., more than alcohol. And that's from being obese and diabetes, etc. Well, one unhealthy meal like that makes your liver transiently look like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, it's impressive. And then it goes away after a few hours. And then, but, so okay, blood vessels, lungs, liver, but it also impacts your red blood cells, those cells that carry around oxygen. One unhealthy meal like that can change their shape. They need to be all floppy so they can go through the little capillaries. Well, they get all spiky, and they get all these oxidative things on their, on their tips. So they, it makes them even more likely to poke a hole in those fibrous caps. So one unhealthy meal, blood vessel function, lung function, liver function, and your red blood cells. It's impressive. Okay. 
Let's talk about some interventional studies. So this is Dr. Ornish's work. And what Dr. Ornish did is he took people with stable cholesterol blockages, kind of like the one we saw up there, the abnormal one that we saw before. Stable cholesterol blockages, and he randomized them into two groups. Group number one was uh, a much healthier lifestyle, eating almost exclusively a plant-based diet, psychosocial support and exercise versus expert care from your regular doctor. And then they looked at the size of the blockages after one year. And after one year, the experimental group, the healthier lifestyle group, their blockages began to shrink. The expert care group, they, be, they continued to grow and get bigger. And they looked again in five years, the same thing. Healthier lifestyle, the, the blockages continue to shrink, and the, uh, un, the expert care, the blockages continue to grow, and the expert care group was about 2.5 times more likely to have a cardiac event than the healthier group. Not surprisingly, the more you adhered to the healthier lifestyle, the better you did in terms of cholesterol blockages shrinking. And this brings me to great work by Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn, who's been an incredible friend and mentor uh, to me and uh, my program. So in this analysis, he looked at people with stable cholesterol blockages also, about 200 of them. And he asked them to eat a whole food plant-based diet, and of course he encourages his patients to also not have oil. And he followed them for about four years, and about 90% of them were adherent to the healthier lifestyle. So of those patients who adhered, 112 had chest pain from cholesterol blockages to begin with, and it got better, improved in about 104. 27 avoided previously suggested stent or bypass surgery, and we see that in our clinic as well. And patients lost, on average, about 18 pounds. And these are patients who already had known heart disease, cholesterol blockages, so a major cardiac event judged to be recurrent disease was 1.6%. That's what they concluded, 0.6%. So of the 21 non-adherent patients, 13 had a recurrent event. That's 62%. 62 versus 0.6%. It's subtle. So, uh, which brings me to the PREDIMED study, which is a really a very impressive study of uh, patients at risk for heart disease, not with known heart disease, but at risk. And what they did is they randomized them to a Mediterranean-style diet or what was essentially a Western diet. And <clears throat> not surprisingly, the Mediterranean-style diet did better. You know, diet's a continuum. Um, but in the Mediterranean arm of that study, with patients at risk for heart disease, but not with known heart disease, they had about a 3.6% event rate. Now, I'm going to compare two different studies, so it's totally apples and oranges, so only hypothesis generating. So 3.6% event rate with no known heart disease. In Esselstyn's study with known heart disease, they concluded a 0.6% event rate. That's impressive. Um, and in the PREDIMED study, um, they did an a priori defined post hoc analysis, means that they, 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 they decided even before they did the study that they were going to do this after the study, so it decreases the bias. And they looked at a pro-vegetarian dietary pattern. So among omnivorous subjects, in that, which was all of them in that study, at high cardiovascular risk, better conformity with a food pattern that emphasized plant-derived foods was associated with the reduced risk of all-cause mortality. So eating more of a pro-vegetarian style diet less all-cause mortality. And this was reinforced by another large epidemiologic study where every standard deviation increase in fruit and vegetable consumption was associated with a 14% lower hazard of death. So this is a great example uh, by Dr. Esselstyn, one of his early patients. And this is a guy who at the time was in his early 40s, thin fit runner, he was a surgeon, a um, couple young kids, and he started having chest pain and they rushed him down to the cath lab, he was having a heart attack. And he died three times, they had to shock him back to life three times. Um, but he survived. And they um, did a coronary angiogram where they put a catheter in the blood vessel in the groin or wrist and thread it up to the heart and inject the blood vessels that feed the heart with blood. With dye and take a picture. So this you can see is the artery here and you can see it's kind of ratty looking right there, that's tons of cholesterol blockage there. 
But at the time, they couldn't put in a stent, they couldn't do bypass surgery, but he survived. But he was pretty bummed. You know, he thought he was pretty healthy, and this is what happened. So he met with Esselstyn and decided to go on a plant-based diet. And he's a surgeon, type A personality, and as you can imagine, he was the picture of compliance. So fast forward three years, he has a, oh yeah, and he also said, I'm not taking any of those cholesterol lowering pills because he didn't trust them. Okay, patient's the boss. So fast forward three years, he has a repeat coronary angiogram. And he walks into Esselstyn's office and he gives him a hug. I've never seen anything come close to this other than this diet. So I want to bring up the COURAGE trial because I want to compare it to Esselstyn's work. Again, it's apples and oranges. But the reason I want to do that is because both of those studies looked at people with stable cholesterol blockages. So in the COURAGE trial, they randomized people into with stable blockages, healthy lifestyle, medications, and a stent to open up the artery versus healthy lifestyle and medications. And after five years, there's no difference. He didn't live longer, not fewer heart attacks, chest pain was the same. So for me, um, that, what that means is a stent in stable disease, not a heart attack, but stable disease is palliative. Okay, great. Let's compare the studies. This is Esselstyn's, this is Courage. In Esselstyn's, they started with the total cholesterol around here and with statin and lifestyle, they got down to there. In the Courage trial with, with lifestyle and statin, they got down to about there. LDL is about the same in both groups. But look at the event rates. They concluded in Esselstyn 0.6%, but in Courage, 19%. What's, how do you account for this difference? Well, my hypothesis, is, my hypothesis is that when you get to an LDL cholesterol level in the 70s on a path that includes a plant-based diet, yeah, it's good for your LDL cholesterol, but it's good for you for dozens and dozens of other reasons accounting for this difference, that's my hypothesis. Okay, in the plant-based diet, chest pain improved in 93% of patients. How about in the COURAGE trial, which included stents? 73%. How many procedures did they prevent? Well, in the, in the plant-based, they prevented 27. How about in COURAGE? Well, they didn't prevent any. There are 348 new procedures. How about lifestyle? Well, in the plant-based, they lost 18 pounds. What about encourage? Where they encouraged people to live more healthfully? Well, they lost, I mean, excuse me, they gained about three pounds. So that's a swing of 21 pounds, which is basically half of my niece. Oops. Plants or burgers, you choose. Uh, this is a picture courtesy of Dr. D'Alessandro, a colleague of mine. This is bypass surgery. Patients laying on their back, faces up here covered with a towel, feeds down there. Um, their chest is sawed in half. That's the heart. Um, it's stopped, it's not beating. And they're doing bypass surgery. And it's great that we can do that if we have to. It's great we can do it if we have to. But what, what I'm about to say has been said. And, but it happens to me too. You know, like when I encourage my patients to eat a salad, like sometimes people tell me that I'm extreme. Like it's somehow extreme that I'm encouraging my patients to eat a salad. Because, of course, I think it's extreme when someone saws my chest in half, stops my heart, takes a vein from my leg, and stitches it back into my heart. Like, when did the world turn upside down? That eating a salad is extreme, and this is perfectly normal. Okay. Diabetes. This is a great study by Dr. Neil Barnard from PCRM. And they took people with type 2 or adult onset diabetes and randomized them to either a plant-based diet or the American Diabetes Association diet. Guess which one won? In the plant-based diet, they came off more diabetes meds, blood sugar fell more, they lost more weight, cholesterol fell more. Let food be thy medicine, medicine be thy food. That's from Hippocrates, the father of, of Western medicine. And so, Doc, I did everything they told me to do. Why did I have a heart attack? Why did I have another one? Well, that's because we have not been telling you the right things to do. This is a great quote by Dr. Stephen DeVries, and it's a great quote not just because he's a cardiologist, which he is, 
Um, but it struck me as a peculiar paradox that guidelines, those are documents that advise us how to practice, guidelines highlight the primary importance of nutrition and lifestyle, yet the physicians who are expected to implement these guidelines receive absolutely no education in these areas <clears throat> during their residency and subspecialty training. So these are advertising dollars spent in 2004. All right, but so the Super Bowl was on recently. So y'all, you know, the draft was here. So y'all remember that great broccoli commercial during the Super Bowl, right? <laughs> right, like of course you don't because there was none. You know, there's no big broccoli. So these are advertising dollars spent in 2004. The top eight fast food chains spent 2.3 billion with a B. There is, some of you may remember there was a five a day program from the government five servings of fruit and vegetables a day. Well, they spent 4.9 million. I couldn't make sense of those numbers in my head, so I turned them into seconds. 2.3 billion seconds and 4.9 million seconds. That's 73 years versus two months. But times are changing. This is a great quote by Dr. Kim Williams, a cardiologist, and he is the past president of the American College of Cardiology, which in my myopic world is a big deal. And he said, I recommend a plant-based diet because I know it's gonna lower their blood pressure, improve their insulin sensitivity, and decrease their cholesterol. Times are changing. So let's circle back to our doesn't want anything stuck in him guy and no aspirin, no statin guy. So he goes plant-based and you can see after three, four months, he's normal weight, blood pressure looks great, LDL cholesterol fell, walks about a mile, then he gets some chest discomfort. Fast forward about a year, um, numbers look great, blood pressure's good, LDL cholesterol's good, jogs about two miles, and I bumped into him about eight or nine months ago, and he now jogs four or five miles, and he stops because he gets bored. <laughs> so the typical question I get here is, you know, Dr. Osville, like, he looks great, and all that stuff, and blah, 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 but what about the HDL? That's the good cholesterol, that fell. That's a good question. So, it's very, very well, dis well first of all, HDL cholesterol is probably gonna fall off its pedestal as a, an important marker, because there's been about five randomized controlled trials where we raise HDL levels, and it either hurts people or doesn't help them at all. And so it may just be more of a marker to some degree than a mediator, but in part it is a mediator. It's well described that when you eat a plant-based diet, HDL levels fall. And it might just be that, because what HDL does, it does reverse cholesterol transport, takes cholesterol from the blood vessel wall and brings it back to the liver for processing. And maybe that if you're eating more healthily, you don't even need as much. But the other thing that happens is HDL really is a double-edged sword. If you eat unhealthfully, HDL could be pro-atherosclerotic. If you eat healthfully, HDL gets healthier. The devil, of course, is in the details. And... <clears throat> There's something called efflux capacity, which is the ability of cholesterol to suck, uh, HDL to suck cholesterol from the wall of the blood vessel and bring it back to the liver. Reverse cholesterol transport. It's efflux capacity or vacuum cleaner ability. And when you eat a plant-based diet, you make the efflux capacity of the HDL particle better. And it turns out that completely independent of the HDL level, high, low, in between, whatever. What matters is, in terms of improving outcome is the efflux capacity, completely independent of the HDL level. And since a plant-based diet can help the efflux capacity improve, I'm very comforted. And when I see this going down, I'm actually secretly happy, because to me, it means the patient is doing it. Okay. We did a world tour, we talked about trimethylamine oxide, we talked about endothelial, some endothelial cells, some interventional studies. We talked about HDL, and oh yeah, LDL oxidation. Remember how we talked about when those endothelial cells, the wallpaper gets injured, and the cholesterol particles in our blood burrow across and then become oxidized like a splinter, become irritating like a splinter? Well, that step of oxidizing it or turning it into something like a splinter is harder to do when you eat a plant based diet. Okay, scary time for me, beyond the heart. Oh yeah, so this reminds me, I wanted to talk a little bit about our program. So I work at Montefiore 
uh, health system, which is, it's actually all over New York now, but based primarily in the Bronx, and that's where I am. Um, and uh, the Bronx, about 100, or, or sorry, 1.7, 1.8 million people, and uh, about 85% of the people who come to Montefiore uh, from the Bronx are on some degree of, of public support, and uh, there's, there's a very large indigent patient population there, so I'm, I feel uh, very honored and privileged to be able to share this information in the Bronx. Um, and <clears throat> so our program, we've got a uh, clinical arm, a, an educational arm, and a research arm. And the clinical arm, that's how it first started like six or so years ago, where I see patients in clinic, I talk about the usual stuff, medications, all that stuff, but I also talk about plant-based nutrition with all of them. I weave it in with every patient visit, and I can go into that in some more detail. Uh, we have handouts for them, which I'll show a couple. Um, and in addition to that, we have these periodic Saturday morning sessions based off of Esselstyn's. They're about four hours long. I speak and RD speaks. We serve lunch. We encourage people to come with a friend or significant other to help them along the way. We take a real deep dive into the how and why of plant-based nutrition. And, uh, you know, we don't charge patients for it. I fund it all through donations. And so I try to democratize this information as much as possible. So that's our outpatient program in a nutshell. But I also see patients in the hospital. So uh, what I used to do is I'd go around in the hospital and I'd go see a patient and I'd go talk about the plants and I'd leave. And then five minutes later, dinner is served and it's chicken. And I'm like totally undercut. I'm like this isn't working. So <clears throat> I had a chance to work with food services and nutrition and we developed plant-based meals for inpatients. So now, you can order plant-based meals for uh, inpatients at Montefiore. Uh, Montefiore, I think, has uh, uh, like 11 hospital or hospital-like institutions, and I think in five of them now, about 1,500 to 2,000 beds, you can order plant-based meals for inpatients. Um, and uh, of course, you can order other stuff too, but you have the option, but that's not enough. We need an educational component to go, to go with it. So they get a handout that gives them some context for the food. And we also now have the great documentary film, Forks Over Knives, playing on continuous loop in the hospital on those little, on those little inpatient TVs. You know, like there's, you got the bed, the TV? Well, it plays on continuous loop on those TVs. I mean, you can watch another channel, but you can also watch Forks Over Knives. And we have Spanish subtitles too, which is very important for us because we have a big uh, DR and uh, Dominican Republic and Puerto Rican uh, population. Um, so now it's great. So now I walk into a patient's room, I tell them about the plants, I order the meals, I put on forks over knives, it's like I have my plant posse with me. Uh, we have a, a pretty robust educational arm. We teach medical students, residents, uh, we get the chance to speak all over. Um, and I guess sort of the flagship aspect of our um, educational arm is a conference that we've developed, which we'd love for all y'all to come. It, and I'll put a little bit of information up about it later. It's on October 6th of this year. It's our second one. It's a preventive cardiology conference, but it is primarily plant-based. I don't have it exclusively plant-based because I want docs who might be interested in the speaker who isn't plant-based to be then trapped there and listen to all the plant-based doctors. <laughs> like, it's cool to speak to the Kool-Aid drinkers, but I want it to be more than that, of course. So, and you know, Many of the people that we all look up to, Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn will be speaking, Dr. Neil Barnard will be speaking, Dr. Kim Williams will be speaking, um, uh, Dr. Colin Campbell will be speaking, Michelle McMacken, Joel Kahn uh, will all be there. So we're really excited about it and hope that you all can make it October 6th. Um, and we have a small research arm as well, and we're, we're trying to grow that um, also. This is one of our handouts. I have three levels of, of degree of plant-based, this is our most healthy level. And I just have patients check it off. Three servings of dark leafy greens, three servings of vegetables, on and on it goes throughout the day. Gives them some guardrails. And I met a pediatric dentist in the audience somewhere. Not sure where she is. There you are. Flossing. Check it off. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the Renaissance cardiologist right here. Uh, so and this is another one of our handouts. How to transition your home into a disease-fighting powerhouse. Very dramatic. But anyway, we hand that out. Um, we have others. So this is a great slide. These are nutrients in plants versus animal-based foods per 500 calories. 
And the plant foods are equal parts tomato, spinach, lima bean, peas, and potatoes. Um, I can't say that without thinking about Dan Quayle. And then animal-based foods are equal parts beef, pork, chicken, and whole milk. So, okay, let's take a look at the nutrients. Cholesterol, you don't need to eat a drop. Your body will make all you need. How about protein? Oh my God, my muscles are gonna go away tomorrow. <laughs> How about beta carotene? It's subtle. <laughs> Dietary fiber, your constipation will go away. We have bones to keep us standing, plants have fiber. Because tight. How about iron? I'm gonna become anemic tomorrow. Calcium, my bones are gonna fall apart. Don't believe me about the protein? You can take the world's strongest man's word for it, who is vegan, and his name is Patrick Baboumian, um, and that's just the perfect name for the world's strongest man. But the reason I know this vegan gentleman is the world's strongest man is because he won the world's strongest man contest. Okay, so we're all used to CAT scans, right? Like looking for something bad. Well, I thought, well, why don't we look for something good? So we can do a kale scan, okay? So things up here are associated with improving or happening less frequently the more toward a plant-based diet you eat. So the more toward a plant-based diet you eat is associated with these things happening less frequently or improving. So it's associated, more of a plant-based diet is associated with living longer, less stroke, less ALS, less dementia, less cognitive decline, improved mood, less acne. In fact, some investigators say that acne is so tightly linked to the toxic Western diet that it's not really a vestige of teenaged angst, but rather your body crying out for help from lack of nutrition. Fewer ear infections, less periodontal disease. Uh, less acid reflux, less laryngeal disease. Less lung disease, less breast cancer. Less heart disease, less obesity. Less diabetes, less inflammation. Less colon cancer, less constipation. Less prostate enlargement. Less prostate cancer. Improved sexual function in men and in women. And we call ED, erectile dysfunction, the canary in the coal mine for heart disease. Um, so, because the artery to the penis, which helps give an erection, is smaller than the artery to the heart. So by the time there's a blockage in the artery to the penis causing ED, it's extremely likely that there's also a blockage in the artery in the heart, but just has not clinically manifested yet. This disease of cholesterol disease or atherosclerosis is a systemic disease. It doesn't just happen in one place. Uh, less bone disease, less lower back pain, improved athletic performance. I think I got most of it. These are some references. <laughs> um, so, well, moving on. <laughs> uh, exercise is... Um, an important part of our program. And this is, of course, the Las Vegas Strip. And as you can see, nobody takes the stairs. But that's OK, because I went to the American College of Cardiology meeting. And I'm like, oh, like you got to be kidding me. This can't really be happening. But I, I don't have this slide here, but a colleague of mine, in the, in the theme of times are changing, a colleague of mine uh, went to the American College of Cardiology conference a couple years ago. And he sent me this same slide, except there was one person on the stairs. So. Um, right, so this is really breaking news. Cancer is increasing among meat eaters, okay? But vegetarians show the lowest mortality of all. This is breaking news from 1907. Uh, this is great stuff by Dr. Ornish and others. So we all have our genes, right? Our hair color, hair color, eye color, eye color. We can't change that. But we might be able to change which ones speak. So in this analysis, they, um, he took men with early stage prostate cancer and put them on his healthier lifestyle. 
which is almost exclusively a plant-based diet, exercise, psychosocial support. He biopsied the prostate at the beginning, he's about 30 guys, and three months later. What happened? Well, many pro-cancer genes were down-regulated in their expression, and many anti-cancer genes were up-regulated in their expression. So you, couldn't, you could not change your genes, but you could change which ones speak, making the healthy ones speak more softly. Wait, nope making the unhealthy ones, excuse me, speak more softly, and the healthy ones speak more loudly. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really quite mind-blowing. But it gets even more mind-blowing because those, that on-off switch, turning the healthy genes on and the unhealthy ones off, at least in animal models, can be passed on to our kids and our grandkids. So the food choices that you make today not only profoundly impacts your health, the environment, and of course has ethical implications as well, but it may also impact the health of your kids and your grandkids. It's pretty mind-blowing and quite a responsibility. Okay, so we did a world tour. We talked about TMAO, endothelial cells, interventional studies, other stuff, HDL, LDL, uh, and some gene expression. I'll mention new 5 gc and I'll skip myeloperoxidase in the interest of time. So NU5GC is a compound on the cells of non-human mammals. And so some investigators in San Diego thought, well, interesting. Maybe if we eat the meat of mammals with NU5GC, maybe we have a reaction to it because it's foreign to us. Maybe we have an immune reaction to it. So what, what they did is they created um, a rat model, a normal rat model that has new 5 gc and a rat model that doesn't. And they fed the rat model that doesn't meat with normally, which has new 5 gc on it. And lo and behold, there was a big inflammatory reaction. They had five times more liver cancer, more inflammation. Um, and what these authors speculated is that maybe it impacts more than just cancer. Maybe what happens is because inflammation is so tightly linked to diabetes and heart disease that when we eat new 5 gc we also have the same kind of um, uh, immune reaction to that and also causing more heart disease. So today, no one cannot deny the possibility of adequate nutrition and the prolonged maintenance of health and vigor on a vegetarian diet. This is, of course, from the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1912, before the term vegan was even coined. What? How did that get in here? This is ridiculous. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Everyone knows it's Marlboro's, come on. Um, so, you know, this used to be in medical journals like 40 years ago, like it has as an advertisement. And so what I'm hoping is it'll take far fewer years for us as a medical profession to wrap our heads around the fact that eating almost exclusively or nearly a plant-based diet is clearly the healthier way to go. So we've talked about the scope of the problem, the path of physiology, why it happens, why a plant-based diet. We went beyond the heart. Uh, this is the website for our program. This is me on the Twitter and Instagram. Uh, and if, for those of you who may be interested in our, our conference, uh, this is the website, mecme.org. You have to be uh, a persevere a bit on the website. It's not the most user-friendly one. But at any rate, it works out in the end. And would love for you all to come uh, to the conference. So thank you very much. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we have time for questions. Before we open it for questions, I just want to remind everybody that uh, next month, uh, June 18th, which is the third Monday in uh, June, our speaker will be Dr. James Loomis, who is head of the Barnard Clinic in Washington, D.C. The Barnard Clinic is part of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, and Dr. Loomis is a former team doctor for the uh, St. Louis baseball team. What's that, the Cardinals? Cardinals. The St. Louis Rams. 
Yeah, exactly. And also for their, the, the St. Louis Symphony. He's now uh, the head of the Barnard Clinic in D.C. Should be a really interesting speaker. Uh, he'll be talking about lifestyle medicine, plant-based nutrition, and also his own personal journey uh, because he made himself healthier on <coughs> a whole food plant-based diet as well, and he's doing marathons now. So uh, can we turn the house lights up, please? And great. Um, any questions? Has there been a consideration to the lectin? Uh, lectin is a compound in beans, and it's gotten some notoriety of late because of this book called The Plant Paradox by a doc Dr. Scott Gundry. And from what I can tell, you know, he had a very excellent career as a cardiothoracic surgeon. Uh, but I, I do think, I personally believe that his book is irresponsible. Um, now, if you take a big picture look at it, the healthiest, the, the longest living populations in the world, the blues, in the blue zones, those with the most amount of centenarians, those living more than 100, ate beans. Um, it's an, they're incredibly dense with nutrients and protein. Um, and if you look at his book, and actually uh, Dr. Uh, Tom Campbell and his, uh, b both of them, uh, they wrote in their nutritionstudies.org, I believe that's what it's called, uh, pay, bl blog for their website, they took a deep dive into the book. And one of the things, and it wasn't, ex it wasn't exhaustive, but they looked at a number of the references that he used to support his claims. And they highlighted instances where they said either exactly the opposite of what he was claiming in the book or were just completely unrelated. To me, that's the height of academic irresponsibility because he's leveraging his credibility as, from what I've heard, as a terrific cardiothoracic surgeon to pass this information on the public where it appears that he may have personal gain for. So to me, that's the height of irresponsibility. If you take a 10,000 foot view, you look at the longest living populations in the world, they eat beans with their scary lectins. So from my standpoint, please eat beans. And I would, my personal opinion is I would not pursue the advice in the plant paradox. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, that's a perfect segue for my question. Um, there, are, there are these, um, these diet doctors now that um, their, their, their advice is really antithetical in some cases to plant-based eating. Meanwhile, the plant-based evidence is, you know, mountainous and their evidence is like, you know, the study from 15 years ago in epileptic children or something. Yeah, so So why isn't the information about a plant-based diet out there further and why are there other people, you know, uh, feeling quite religious about different styles of eating that they think is healthy? Well, sometimes people of course like to hear good things about their bad habits. Um, and I just want to back up for a second. I have no, uh, I have nothing to sell. I have no book. I have no product. In fact, I personally earn less by practicing this way. But I feel like it's the right thing to do, so I'm going to do it. Some of these dietary docs uh, or people pushing certain diets, they have a vested fiscal interest. They have something to sell you. Uh, they're, they're, a lot of their livelihood is wrapped up on that. Okay. Um, so. Uh, how do we get this information out there more? Well, it, it's, I, I look at it like a ripple effect, and I agree. The, the people who are very much, it's sort of like, to some degree, the political polarization in the country, the, real, the extremes are really socked in. Well, I feel like it's somewhat similar in the dietary thing, and maybe that's just a human nature um, aspect. But, um, you know, the, uh, getting the information out there through as many venues as possible. It's events like this and, and talking to people and ripple effects. And then there are great documentary films. A big one's going to be coming out called The Game Changers, which hopefully will be a game changer. Uh, this is one backed by um, uh, James Cameron of Titanic fame. Uh, it's going to be all about like 
you know, demystifying the, meat, the myth that real men eat meat. Uh, so keep an eye out. And Dr. Little. Loomis is one of the, sp the speaker who's coming next month. He's a star in that movie, so you get to see a movie star. That's awesome, yeah. And I was filmed for that movie, but I didn't make the cut. So <laughs> I think I had a bad hair day or something. But uh, so you guys will be stepping it up when you come a little later in June to hear Dr. Loomis speak. Um, so uh, there's uh, getting the information out there, you know, like, um, I, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, you know, there are politicians who are more plant-based. I believe Cory Booker is more plant-based. Just sort of getting the news out there from every different angle. Education in the medical setting. And you're right. In terms of their evidence base, I don't think it comes anywhere close to the evidence base that we have in plant-based nutrition. Look, if Woody Allen turns out to be right and we wake up in 20 years and fried chicken and ice cream is good, then fine. I'll ask my patients to eat fried chicken and ice cream. But that's not really going to happen. Um, and if you look at the longest living populations, getting back to the other question, like the segue you were saying, they eat almost exclusively a plant-based diet. There is no long living population that I've ever heard of that eats an animal-based diet, period. I mean, it, we, no, and then, then when you start to zero it down, there's lots of science and translational science studies to back that up in all kinds of different ways. But if you look at it from a 10,000 foot point of view, that's pretty impressive. So. Help spread the word, you know, encourage Beyonce to tweet about it more. I mean, seriously, like when she, I could scream to the end of time and she sends out one tweet and more people are talking about veganism than I will ever touch. But then sometimes the vegan crowd will create a circular firing squad and she's not vegan enough or not vegan long enough. Please just stop. Mm -hmm. um, let's not perf let perfection be the enemy of good and encourage that stuff. So I don't know. We need everyone's help. If I could just back up something that you just said too. Also, as far as the profit motive goes, uh, that we got ourselves into this problem because of there's so much money sloshing around in various um, industries. And if you look at the bottom of our, our every web page on our website, it says teaching skills, not selling products, and that's the delib there's deliberately there's a reason for that. If we think you need a supplement, we send you to the drugstore. So that's where you get your B12. We don't sell it to you, and that's really really important because you want to make sure the advice you're getting. Uh, that the person who's giving you that advice is not profiting from something that you're selling. I think it's a really big deal. Unfortunately, when you do that, though, you end up with less money to actually work with and advertise. And, and Dr. Osfeld said, you know, he could be making more money doing, not doing this, and so could we, uh, which is why we started the Institute. So if you want to make a contribution to the Institute, <laughs> that's a, we'd be very happy for that. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. Want the microphone? So I'm curious, I wanted to ask you one question. Um, I battle with my health insurance company. Um, and I'm trying to educate my health insurance company and they keep denying me um, the, the idea of a plant-based diet. Every time I, I fight for it and, and ask for it, they, they want me to follow a DASH diet. Dash diet, and I said, no, 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 I, that's not good. I want to follow a plant-based diet, and I, I fight with them over about it, and they keep rejecting me. They're they're very. Um, I'm wondering if it's possible if, if any of you, you two, or or any other people can contact Blue Cross Blue Shield, Excellus, uh, MVP, and show them the evidence that plant-based diet is effective, so they could save their money that they're they're wasting on all these different things to treat. So I'm just wondering. Yeah, that's a great question. And people are trying to do that in a couple of different ways. And you're absolutely right. I mean, if you want to make change, have, you know, it would be wonderful if insurance companies were pushing that. Now, the DASH diet was actually initially a veg like a vegetarian diet. Um, I don't, actually, I think the original version didn't have any animal products at all, I think. But then Frank Sachs, who created it, well thought that wouldn't be acceptable for the general population. Then he like built back in some animal products. So it was originally like almost exclusively, if not exclusively, a plant-based diet. Um, and there is unfortunately no head-to-head -head study between a DASH diet and a whole food plant-based diet. So I think that may be some of where of the academic uh, hurdles are. But if you think about it, I think you're right. You know, for those companies that self-insure, which is I think most people get their insurance through uh, companies now and also uh, health insurance companies, um, they could save a lot of money. And 
there are companies that are piloting exactly what you're talking about. Let's put 50 of our patients on a plant-based diet and see what happens to them. And if that goes well, well then we'll expand it. So there are some moves afoot with that, but we're not where we need to be yet. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so it was with statin. Are you, if you're talking about, so the question is, um, you showed data on total cholesterol getting around to around 150. Was that on statin or not on statin? And I believe you're talking about the slide where I compared Esselstyn's study to the Courage trial, and they both of them had statin, um, including to whatever, whatever degree of healthy li or lifestyle they were encouraging. I have many patients who are on both a whole food plant-based diet and a statin. I look at prevention as belt and suspender. Uh, you want to do everything we can to help protect people. And of course, I see people who are enriched for disease, because I'm a cardiologist, they have a lot of cardiac disease. And if you, read, if you read the internet, statins are like the worst thing that's ever happened in all time, of all time, but it's actually pretty irresponsible. Um, they're, exquisitely well studied, better study than aspirin, and for, they're of course not for everybody, but for the right person they can be exquisitely effective. Uh, so uh, th that was both, and of course I have patients who are on both. Yes, sir. I know you were talking about um, HDL and LDL cholesterol, and that HDL, even if you can see it start to drop down, you're not too concerned with that. Do you happen to see like, a certain ratio among patients that yeah, I mean, the question is, you know, is there an optimal, like maybe total cholesterol, HDL ratio? I mean, in general, for the general population, the lower the better, because from a 500 foot view, the higher your HDL level, epidemiologically, you do better. Um, but from my standpoint, but we, we also, there's no study that shows that raising HDL does better with, you know, medication does better um, for that purpose. They actually, there, there's five where they either do the same or a little bit worse. So I don't look at a ratio at all. Um, I look at it like limbo. You know, how, with LDL, how low can you go? And if they, I may have some patients in their 30s, and I'm, perf you know, I'm perfectly happy uh, with that. Um, and I, I don't, I don't look at a ratio, I just, my main thing is to try to get them to eat a plant-based diet. And if their HDL dips, if it goes down 15 points, well, then I, I think that means they have better efflux capacity uh, and they're deriving benefits for lots of other reasons. So one more quick question. Is it me? Oh. So I was at a cardiology appointment today for two hours, and in that um, evaluation, family member, he recommended the men and he focused on oils as being part of the, it was like on the top of the list to go to and get rid of the saturated fat, which is fine, but I was kind of shocked that, I wanted to ask more questions to him and kind of challenge him on it because I've been attending a lot of these types of venues, um, but why is it that he, you know, promotes walking and riding your body to work and, you know, all the other things, why did he pick the Mediterranean diet as a lifestyle change? Uh, so why the Mediterranean diet? Well, it's, it's well studied, um, and as part of various guidelines, they do recommend it. So it's sort of mainstream medical recommendation, and it is indeed healthier than a typical Western diet. So, you know, sometimes a doc will, may make the assessment, I don't think this, maybe that doc doesn't know about plant-based diet, or maybe they do, and they thought that the person sitting in front of them just wouldn't do it. I, I don't know, I'm just speculating. But a Mediterranean-style diet is just much easier for people to describe because everyone kind of just sort of knows what that is. Or, I mean, I guess we don't really know because there's how many countries are on the Mediterranean, but we all have a general sense of what it is. Um, look, I don't think it's as healthy as a plant-based diet. Um, the real Mediterranean-style diet, you know, it's not like eat what you eat and then put olive oil on it. It was like from the island of Crete in the 1950s and was post-war, and they're all, there's near starvation. They rarely had animal products. And they, and they were walking five miles a day to grow their crops, and they had to have some oil and stuff, otherwise they'd run out of calories. Um, and so, you know, that, and it was much, much more plant-based than what we see today as a Mediterranean-style 
diet. And some people, including Dr. Colin Campbell, say that the Mediterranean-style diet is healthful despite the oil. Maybe it would be healthier without the oil. Um, so I, I don't think oil is healthful for a few reasons. You take a perfectly good olive, have that, with all the phytonutrients and fiber, and then you suck out all the fat, leaving behind all that stuff. You just have a pile of fat with almost no nutrients, and it's 120 calories per tablespoon, the most, nutri most calorically dense uh, thing we have. And you, know, you see what happens, like someone has a salad, and they put oil on, and then they chat with their friend, and blah, 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 and next thing you know, there's a ton of oil. That's hundreds and hundreds of calories. Like, you could put ice cream on there, and it'd be fewer calories. <laughs> Probably be tastier. Um, so the, um, and we also know that olive oil can acutely worsen blood vessel function. Remember how we were talking about the dilation stuff? Well, there's a cool study that Vogel did. You gave someone a salad and their blood vessels dilated up, but you gave them a salad plus olive oil, didn't dilate up as much. It's like the olive oil was mitigating the benefits of the salad. So I, I, I encourage my patients to not have oil. Um, I don't go to the mat on it because there's not like hundreds of studies like that, but I do encourage it. And anecdotally, Esselstyn's study, they didn't have oil. And my patients who have the most obscene turnarounds you've ever seen are the ones who are also giving up oil.